Hey everybody, it's Gary Lucas. Uh, here it's June 18th, Thursday, and this is part two of my tribute to the one and only incredible Captain Beefheart, so let's get right down to it. Anyway, a little paraphrase of a track called Sun Zoom Spark, one of the, the most exciting of all Beefheart compositions as an out and out rocker with a kind of a cowbell action going on that really drives the track. And uh, anyway, so part two, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this and that all related to Captain Beefheart. Uh, we covered some ground with Trout Mask Replica because part one was all about Trout Mask, or at least as much as I could squeeze in in the time uh, I do these things. A couple of things to add. I played uh, a solo arrangement of the guitar parts for Sugar and Spikes, one of my favorite tracks, and I should have mentioned that in the middle there's an interpolation of a theme by the Spanish composer Rodrigo, the Concerto de Aranjue, which was pretty much side one of Miles Davis's sketches of Spain. And again, this was something I asked John about whether this what he was consciously quoting Miles, and he said, oh yeah. So, uh, you know, I mean, it fits into his general pattern of fashioning these, these songs treating music as sculpture. I mean, he was essentially a sculptor from the earliest age when he was discovered by another Rodrigo, Augustino Rodrigo. See how everything connects? It's all uh, a beautiful pattern if you connect the dots. So uh, anyway, that lyric is a description of sort of going out in LA uh, and living it up and having a high old time and part of it, I guess, was listening to Sketches of Spain as the soundtrack to Don's teenage years, because as I mentioned, he was a huge jazz fan. And I also mentioned, you know, that uh, many black jazz musicians of the free school came to see his concert, the same concert I was at, which was his debut in New York, 1971, including Mingus, who I guess didn't care for it so much, but uh, who did care for it was former Mingus sideman and an incredible leader in his own right, Rasan Roland Kirk. He loved Beefheart. And Dorthan Kirk told Don that uh, after he passed that Rasan would wake up in the middle of the night and say, we got to hear this album and he put on Trout Mask Replica. Uh, I got people writing in, commenting about how... Uh, extreme that music is and how friends of theirs that they tried to turn on to that album had reacted uh, sometimes negatively, sometimes violently. So I can share one little story. I have a very good friend from college named Ken Hurwitz and uh, he lives very close by here. And I've worked with him on some of my records because he's also a singer. And he was in a situation whereby uh, he went away to China He's married to a Chinese woman, Mi Ling Tsui. And when he came back, he found that the roommates uh, that he had trusted had brought in friends of theirs and usurped his room in the apartment. And he didn't know how to get rid of these people. So I suggested to him as a kind of a joke, be careful like what you say, uh, that why didn't he try to blast Trout Mask Replica at about 6 a.m. in the morning at full volume, which he did and uh, it had the desired effect and the people freaked out and said, are you crazy? You know, we're gonna call the cops. And anyway, by sundown, they were gone. They were gone from that apartment and he was able to get his room back. So, hence some of the beneficial properties of the Van Vliet over there manifest 
uh, right before you now. So I want to give a shout out because I forgot to do this. I ran out of time to some of my patrons in the last week or so. Jonathan Luftig, uh, he said, I love the Beef Art Show. Your music has done a lot for me. And he's a multiple contributor. I'm so happy. Uh, Michael Lutz, thanks for getting me hooked on I'm Glad. That's also incredible. That's a Skip James tune that was covered by Cream and uh, one of my favorites, David Stovall. Uh, Anthony Tony Ammerman, he sent me money specifically for falafel sandwiches. Okay, well, we'll take the hint, Caroline and I. Maxim Igor Popovich, Fast and Bulbous, he wrote. Yes, I was involved in a Beef Heart tribute with uh, Philip Johnston, who leads the Microscopic Septet. We recorded two very good, I think excellent albums of uh, instrumental versions of Beef Heart music that came out on the Cuneiform label. Uh, the first one is called Pork Chop Blue Around the Rind, which was a uh, an image extracted from a Van Vliet impromptu poetry session here in my apartment. I think I posted that earlier down the timeline if you want to check the actual original recording. And the second album we did was called Waxed Oop, An Impetuous Dream Bubbles Up. Uh, I have notebooks filled with Don's uh, art, sketches that he made in the book. He would just pick it up at random and uh, also, fantastic poetry and stream of consciousness images. I'll get to that. I'm getting away from myself. Colin John Campbell. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. Nicholas Monin. Again, Yasser Taba. He must be a third or fourth time contributor. He said, can't wait for the Beef Heart tribute. Okay, well, here it comes. And there's a part three on uh, Saturday at three. Mark Green, another uh, multiple contributor. Guy Levy, thank you. Uh, most recently, Robin DeMeo. See, the list goes on and on. I'm loaded, man. Uh, Mark Young, John Goodman, David Jenkins, Carl Berger, not the Carl Berger, who uh, is the improvising music musician, but C-A-R, I think from the UK, Carl Berger. Phil Stutt, a multiple contributor. Hakau Angberg from Scandinavia, love your sessions and guitar playing. Well, I love to play for you guys. And so back to, back to the front here. I was in a tribute with Denny Wally, John French, and Rockette Morton, and also Michael Trailer and Robert Williams. Great drummer, maybe uh, the most hard hitting of all the Beef Heart drummers. The, this is a point of contention. I think they're all great. Uh, I was in there for a couple of years, and it's called The Magic Band, and uh, toured extensively in the UK a couple of times with them. And some dates in Europe, we got as far as playing in uh, Belgrade, Serbia, an amazing concert there in the old castle, and uh, that was a trip. And uh, I think I'll take something out of the collection. There's so much I could show you, and, uh, you know... Here is something that Don inscribed to me in 1975 in his notebook, and I had it laminated. Of course, it's registering backwards. That's what Facebook streaming does. And it's one of his poems that he copied out, and I'll read it. And it says, one nest rules after another. I think he meant rolls. Here he spelled it R-O-O-L-S. Until there are, capital R, no longer any birds, one tongue lashes another, until there are no longer any words. I love fails no birds. To Gary, love Don Van Vliet. Uh, yeah, that poem it actually was written out on the sleeve of the Mirror Man album. My friend Arthur Levy, for whom I wrote a piece all about Beefheart many years ago in uh, Zoo World magazine, which was uh, trying to be a competitor to Rolling Stone, I did a long uh, uh, review of a live show at Town Hall. He's asked me to do a bibliography, Arthur has, of, I don't know, the whole canon, but that's a lot of albums there. I think that's, there's at least 10 or 11 Beefheart albums. 
So I might just do a write-up on my favorites, four or five of them for you. So that's coming. I'm going to watch for that. Uh, I'll now play a little more music. Let's bring over the siege tourneau. Uh, I love this round chair designed by Le Corbusier. And uh, anyway, when Caroline and I got married, I saw this in the restaurant that we had a reception for, and I said, I gotta get one of these. <laughs> My friend James Marshall requested China Pig. This is on Trout Mask Replica, and it's played by Doug Moon, another unsung genius of the very early Magic Band. He was like, I think the first guitarist in there with Alex Snaufer. And he appears on this one track on Trout Mask doing an improvised, it sounds like an improvised country blues. Uh, I don't know if Don was extemporizing, but he might have been because on a good day, he was, he was just incredible. He was dropping pearls everywhere. He'd look at anything, and I mean, I can, I'll give you an example. true story uh, I performed that kind of like that uh, in a club I had a residency during a couple of years in a club in Taipei Taiwan uh, called the idea house and uh, one night I just started to play that not on that guitar I didn't have that guitar then but on somebody's guitar and uh, because there was a language difficulty and uh, maybe perhaps a little barrier here to understanding and one of the patrons a Chinese person in the bar got up and made threatening gestures at me and said are you calling Chinese people pigs and I had to try and cool him out <laughs> and explain that actually it was a poetic metaphor for breaking open one's piggy bank I don't know if you had one I had one that was in the shape of the, a globe of the world the people could fit nickels and dimes in the slot. I used to charge kids to see horror films in my basement when I was a young boy. Yeah, so I don't want to kill my Chinese. My China pig has nothing to do with Chinese people. And uh, yes, in fact, I'm a, quite a, uh, an aficionado of Chinese culture. And uh, anyway, so just goes to show you, be careful sometimes what you say because people take things out of context and if you're at all ironic or being like sarcastic or funny or nuanced, sometimes the joke is on you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm gonna like show you another another prize out of the collection now. If I don't topple the guitar over in the first place. Okay, let's take a little walk over to the couch now. Uh, the reason this couch has this this purple blanket on it is because Lulu has destroyed a lot of the cushion underneath it by digging for bones, imaginary bones. And uh, right over here is, I don't know how you can, if you can see this, but okay. Right over here, in focus, I hope. Anyway, it's in glass. But it's a drawing that Don gave me in 1979. It's maybe one of the best. 
that he did that I've seen and I was so grateful to be the recipient there's a lot going on in there and uh, it's so great that Kurt Loder my old friend who was an MTV news uh, the head of the news department for many years when they first started he was a senior editor at Rolling Stone and a big Beefheart fan he invited me to submit it to be photographed and it ran as a random note that piece of art just by itself with news that we were working on a new album and i remember going up to their offices and jan wenner himself coming out to look at it and uh anyway it's uh you can look at actually some of my beef art art collection online i've got pretty good scans of a bond shop with all the backstories about the pieces, just go to garylucas.com slash www slash DVV for Don Van Vliet. And uh, you can see them and read about them. Okay. And uh, I think I'll play another tune now on electric guitar. And this is from a later Beefheart album. And this one is uh, called Suction Print. Now, it originally was titled Pompadour. And uh, I first heard it, they, the band opened with this at Town Hall in 1973. Jim Igo, who does jazz promo services, press releases for me, was there. And there are tapes of that bootleg circulating. It was an incredible show that featured uh, Don with Artie Tripp on drums. Arthur Dyer Tripp, otherwise known as Ed Marimba. He was also known as Artie with the green mustache. Uh, and I saw him backstage applying a green crayon to tint his mustache. And he said to me, the fans would be crushed if they knew this wasn't my real green. Anyway, Artie Tripp on percussion. Zoothorn Rollo, Bill Harker road, killing him on uh, slide guitar and electric guitar. Alex Snaufer, who goes all the way back to the first album of Beefheart's uh, Safe as Milk, was in on this tour for a while. And uh, he was playing guitar on the, on the date. And Mark Boston, who otherwise known as Rockhead Morton, was third guitar. I wouldn't say any of them. I mean, like, Zuthorn was playing the leads mainly, but they were all contributing great lines. So there was a three guitar lineup and Roy Estrada from the Mothers, who at that point had been given the name Orejon, sorry, Orejon, which Don said meant big donkey ears in Spanish. He was playing bass. And uh, this was to me, I mean, I saw the band play at Ungano's and that was incredible with John French and Elliot Ingber and the double drums and the marimba, but this was also fantastic. I went there with my friend Bill Mosley, who was my buddy and partner at Yale in the Horror Film Society. Bill is now a very prominent actor in horror films himself. And we, you know, we had our minds blown that night. And then I went backstage to talk to Don because at this point I'd gotten very friendly with him. And then I wrote the whole account up. So if you go to beefheart.com, I want to direct you to that website. Uh, big thanks to Steve Froy and uh, Graham and the other people who tend it for keeping the flame alive on Don's work. And uh, I think my article is reprinted there. It may also be on my website somewhere. I don't know. Uh, I got a lot of a lot of stuff, artifacts. Am I? <laughs> So uh, let's see.
suction prints, partially suction prints, uh, an abridged version. And that was finally recorded in the studio for the album Shiny Beast, which was kind of Don's comeback album, I would say, after two considered disastrous albums on Mercury Records, Unconditionally Guaranteed and Blue Jeans and Moonbeams. Uh, the progression of Don's work is very interesting. The first album, Safe as Milk, was so radical in a way and so good, but very accessible and listenable with actual uh, songs, as most people know them as songs. Uh, this thing was uh, praised to the skies when it came out in 1966, produced by my friend Fred Perry's brother, Richard Perry, and Bob Krasnow, who was also managing Don for a moment. And there are pictures of both John Lennon and George Harrison at home with the bumper sticker. There was a bumper sticker that came with the original album with a day glow writing Safe as Milk and a picture of a little baby. Uh, Don said the title Safe as Milk was a reference to the Strontium 90 count in Mother's Milk, uh, a reference to the fact that atomic testing had produced uh, visible radiation results in the breast milk of uh, mothers, which was alarming, of course, at the time. At, at the same time, Don often claimed that the reason he was as uh, creative and unusual as he was because he grew up uh, near where they did atomic bomb testing, kind of, at, at, you know, near Edwards Air Force Base in Lancaster. I don't know. Uh, I just think he was really one of a kind, a uh, diamond in the rough, and certainly the most artistic person I ever met. Uh, what else can I tell you? I mean, just off the top of my head, oh yeah, I was talking about Roland Kirk. One of the best uh, stories of that uh, was how I, you know, got into the band. People want to know. Well, I met him actually after knowing him for some years. I'd met him because he was coming to do a concert up at Yale. And I had seen this debut show in New York at Ungano's, which convinced me that my destiny lay with playing with this guy. I mean, I promised to myself, if I ever do anything in music, I'm gonna play with this guy. And then uh, six months later, the program director at WYBC-FM, Yale's radio station, said, as you're such a big fan, you should interview him. So I have a reel-to-reel -reel tape in my collection. You can hear my voice tremble on it. He's in Boston doing press interviews for the day. They had a day off on this East Coast tour. And he comes on the line and I'm like, oh, you know. I, first of all, he'd been on the cover of Rolling Stone at this point. Can you imagine these days anybody at all in the avant-garde sector of things being on the cover of that magazine? Unlikely, but you never know. One hopes. Anyway, so Don put me at ease right away. This big booming voice came over in a very low register. Hello, Gary, how are you? And, uh, you know, he just made me feel good. So we had a relaxed interview and touched on all sorts of things. And I mentioned Fred Perry and he said, oh, say hello to Richard, tell him to say hello to his brother. And we talked about a lot of stuff. I'll have to, you know, digitize that and post it, but uh, it was a good one. Then he came up and I met him uh, right on the day, they were the afternoon to do their concert, but they didn't sound check. And it didn't quite come across, there were sound problems and I don't know, the band wasn't really into it so much. And that was disappointing. But anyway, I went down to see him shortly thereafter in New York and he was much better and the band was better. And people loved them. Uh, they played twice in that period. Uh, the second time, on a bill right in the middle, sandwiched between a young Billy Joel, of all people, opening, just solo piano and songs, and the Jay Giles Band as the headliners. And my friends and I were heckling Billy Joel. I, I don't know, you know, uh, he was doing impressions and we were yelling, do Nixon, do Nixon. So, uh, yeah. anyway, Don and I stayed to friends and then I saw him every time he played around 
Manhattan, mainly, or in New York at Town Hall several times, and went backstage, wrote him up, and then lost touch with them, and then I heard about these Mercury albums, and they just sounded really dismal. I got them, and there was some good songs on there, but like the whole creative thrust seemed to have been dissipated, or he was really going for a more commercial sound, and maybe he was, you know, because he's pictured on the cover of Unconditionally Guaranteed clutching dollar bills in his hand, and it says love over gold, on the back, which is sort of contradicts the front. But in any case, uh, you know, as he said once uh, to a heckler, I got a right to win a Grammy. You know, if that's what made him happy, then go for it. But uh, I just sort of kept my distance when the next one came out, Blue Jeans and Moonbeams. And yet there are people, like we were on tour in Australia, Gods and Monsters and myself doing a Jeff Buckley, Tim Buckley tribute. And I was amazed at how many people, including people like Steve Kilby of The Church, would cite tracks from Blue Jeans and Moonbeams as their favorite Beefheart song. So go figure. The one that they particularly seem to like is called Observatory Crest, by the way. And uh, anyway, I didn't think any more of it, and I thought maybe, you know, Don had had his heyday. And I was then in New York in 1976, uh, after a lost year, I won't go into here, but I was getting ready to go live and, and work in Taipei, Taiwan. I was studying Chinese in Syracuse, and I saw in the paper that C Captain Beefheart, as special guest of Frank Zappa, was going to make an appearance at the Syracuse War Memorial. So I got my buddy Tom Prouda, who's my Facebook friend, and we went down to see the show, and then Don was... Uh, looking lost when they were packing up. Uh, he was great, by the way, in the show, which some of which came out on the Bongo Fury album. And uh, I met Denny Wally there, and we all went out because Don wanted to have ribs. And the rib story is Don told me that he was with Roland Kirk one night, and Roland was saying, Don, we got to get some ribs. It was midnight. I'm so hungry. Let's go get some barbecued spare ribs. And Don said to Roland, Roland, the only place you can get ribs at this point, maybe it was 3 o'clock in the morning, the only place you can get ribs at 3 a.m. is in the Bible. So uh, anyway, we went out. I found this rib joint that was basically operated in a guy's backyard in the ghetto in Syracuse uh, that was like an underground culinary delight. And Don loved it. And in the middle of our chow down, I said, if you ever put your band together again, I would like to, a chance to audition. And he said, you mean to say you play the guitar, man? Really? Why didn't you tell me? Like indignant about it or something. And I said, well, honestly, I didn't think I was good enough, you know, because really, in order to play a lot of this music, you have to really be up uh, technically on your game. But you see, I was studying it secretly in my spare time so I said I want a shot to audition he said okay bring your guitar up I'm playing in Boston with Frank on Friday and I took the Greyhound bus up there met him at the stage door I w went with Bill Mosley to the show and then uh, went back to his hotel and auditioned and he said yeah we gotta do something but he was vague anyway I had a ticket to leave to Taipei two weeks later and that I did, and I had adventures. But when I got back with my new Chinese bride, Ling, in tow, we were uh, trying to get set up in San Francisco, struggling. And uh, I rang him up, and he said, oh, Gary, it's great hearing from you. Well, you got to come and see the band now. I put a band together, and we're playing at the Keystone of Berkeley. So I went there and reinitiated my uh, friendship with Don and stayed in touch with them after we moved to New York and uh, stayed in touch for a couple of years while I was working at CBS Records. And finally in 1980, or, early, or maybe right in 79 at the end, he said, okay, I want you to be on the next record. And I'm sending you some music. And that became Flavor Bud Living, a solo guitar piece, which kind of put me on the map as a guitar player. And I see we're running out of time and so, I just wanted to say, I want to thank Paul Burkholst, who's like one of Coda Clute's coterie of people for this beautiful Beefheart 
doll. I don't know where he acquired it or who made it, but he gave it to me when the Magic Band played at the Paradiso about 2005 or 2006. Paul came forward with this and it, down with the top hat and the little uh, goatee and uh, the green fur-lined coat that he's wearing on the cover of Trout Mask. And I got more Beefheart stories and music for you guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. I love playing for you and talking about Captain Beefheart, Don Van Vliet, and the genius and uh, of everybody who worked with Don. Because it ain't easy. It wasn't easy then. It isn't easy to play this music now. And I give everybody who hung in there long enough to uh, to play with Don and record with them big, the biggest of props. And I'll mention more names next week, okay? But love to you guys. Stay safe. The Times today, the New York Times had an article about kids, people in New York, uh, just basically fucking off the social distancing and, you know, really, you guys, knock it off. Watch it. It's dangerous. And uh, the, we're right in the beginning of the first wave. We're not nearly, uh, it's not too early. Uh, it's not too late, it's, but it might be too late if you don't social distance. So, uh, anyway, you know what I'm saying. See you on Saturday, 3 p.m., okay? Love you guys.